voice that's calling me to trust in you like a father.
trembles at his wound.
know that your eyes are like flames of fire I know that your head is white as wool I know that your voice it sounds like waters Jesus, you're beautiful And I know that your eyes are like flames of fire I know that your head is white as wool And I know that your voice it sounds like waters Jesus, you're beautiful your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your hair is white as wool, and I know that your voice it sounds like wars. Jesus, you're beautiful, and I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your hair is white as wool, and I know that your voice it sounds like wars. Jesus, you're beautiful. like waters. Jesus, you're beautiful, and I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your head is white as wool, and I know that your voice it sounds like waters. Jesus, you're beautiful, and I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. I know that your head is white as wool, and I know that your voice it sounds like waters. Jesus, you're beautiful.
washed us in his blood we give you our
I've ever been Draw me away and I will run Call my name and I will come closer than I've ever been And I admit my need for you to draw Here and now Draw me away Closer to you, Jesus Draw me away Into wholehearted abandonment Takes your love to love you, so come and touch. I ask you, touch me with that burning flame of love inside your heart. I will never be the same, I will be set apart. So draw me away, and I will run. Call my name. I will come closer than I've ever been So draw me away I will come call my name I will come closer than I've ever been Come be the fire Jesus, we say that we love you and we long to love you more, more and more, Lord, the way that you love us. So we just give ourselves to you again and again and again and say, draw us after you, Jesus, and we will run. Amen. We're going to get ready for our offering tonight. We also have our uh, notes. They got here late. I apologize. So we're going to pass those out in a moment as well, if you'd like them, or if, you're, uh, if you normally get them. So ushers uh, can take care of that. And uh, get ready for our offering. Just not a lot of announcements tonight. Just uh, know that we're going to, in a moment, I'm going to preach. And then uh, after our special and our offering time, and then we're going to have uh, some time afterwards to linger, to wait on the Lord, to see what's on His heart tonight for us in terms of ministry. And we'll, uh, we'll linger, asking Him to break in with healing, with power, freedom on our hearts. Whatever's on His heart tonight, we're going to linger after the message and wait on Him and, and uh, expect Him to break in on us tonight. And so, ushers, go ahead, come on up. 
Let's go ahead and take tonight's offering. You can, uh, if you're giving by check, you can make your checks out to IHOP Kansas City, IHOP KC, if you'd like to do that. Good. Just this weekend, uh, Dwayne Roberts is going to be preaching tomorrow night. Glad for that. I want to ask you to continue to pray for Mike as he's in uh, Korea. Of course, as you know, to continue to pray for those in the Pacific, Japan, what's happening there. Ed Hackett. Go ahead, ushers. You can go ahead and start taking the offering. Uh, good evening. I just have uh, some, uh, some sad news to, to share with our family here. Uh, one of our uh, leaders, one of our senior leaders, uh, um, Jim Mayer, uh, today uh, passed away, had an accident. Uh, and I just wanted to, to share that news with you and uh, have an opportunity here to pray with you. Jim, uh, as many of you know, and some maybe that you don't know, Jim and his wife Elizabeth have led the uh, Israel mandate for many, many years. Jim has been part of our uh, leadership uh, really f as far back as I can remember. And uh, today he was, uh, he was out doing the, one of his passions that he loves to do. He was with his, uh, uh, taking his daughter and, their, and his, grand, uh, his grandson, he was taking him to a park uh, north of Kansas City. He was uh, riding on his motorcycle. That's what he loved to do, was ride his motorcycle. And uh, the, uh, his daughter was following uh, behind in the uh, car, and, uh, in, uh, an, and a truck pulled out in front of him. He did not have any opportunity to, no, uh, to react, and, uh, and uh, he uh, passed away this afternoon through that accident. So I've been with uh, Elizabeth, and the leaders have been with Elizabeth this afternoon, and she just uh, wanted uh, our body to know, and I want our body to know just, just how much uh, Jim uh, loved, obviously loves the Lord. He loved the Lord with his passion and uh, loves, loved this body. He loved everything that he did here. Loved IHOP. He loved, had a passion for the Israel mandate and led so well. And so I just want to just take a time tonight where we would just, maybe even just stand with me. I would just like to pray for uh, Elizabeth, uh, his wife, and his daughter, and the, and the son, and his extended family, just that the Lord would pour out grace upon them. Uh, he is a dear man, and he's with the Lord. He loves the Lord. And, uh, and more, more will come forth about Jim's life, but uh, only the Lord knows just how precious this man is though he is a dear friend to, to many of us, too. So let's pray. Father, we just uh, thank you tonight that you love us, and you love this man, and you love this family. And we thank you, Lord, for the, the way that, uh, Lord, that uh, Jim has been to, with us uh, as a gift to us. And we bless his family tonight. We bless Elizabeth and the extended family. And even as they gather over the next uh, few days and, uh, to, to meet here, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you would pour out your grace upon them. We ask you to pour out your blessing upon them. Lord, we ask you to be near them. Lord, be near our body here, Lord, as we, uh, we just mourn their loss, yet celebrate that, his, that he is with you. Lord, how we walk that out, Lord, you, you know well, Lord, you, you're so good at helping comfort through these times. So, Lord, I ask that you would pour out your grace, pour out your love upon Elizabeth and upon this community, Lord, and, uh, at this, uh, this time. In Jesus' name, amen. ashes say cause they will fade away when he comes for me by grace through faith in Christ I'm saved and I am not the same when he looks at me I am the
on every side I take refuge in the truth I am the rose to you My life is more than meets the eye I'm hidden now in Christ And I'm one with Him My love is real before His eyes Is ravished by the sight Of one glance from me I am turn for a moment to Psalm 139. It's not really what I'm talking about tonight, I'm talking about the four soils, Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8, I'm talking about the parable of Jesus and the four soils, but I wanted to start by looking at Psalm 139, the prayer of David. 
Psalm 139, it's beautiful, beautiful psalm. Oh, Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you, we ask that you would fill this room with your Holy Spirit. We ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. We ask that you would enlighten the eyes of our understanding. God, that we would have eyes to see what we normally cannot see. God, that you would help us that you would awaken our hearts to truth. It would show us the hope of your calling, the riches, the greatness, and the glory of your power, your exceedingly great power at work on our behalf, working towards us and for us and in us. God, I'm asking for the release of that power in this room right now. The preaching of your word, waiting on you, Asking God, as we wait on you, meet us in power on the mind, on the heart, and on our bodies. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Psalm 139, such a beautiful psalm. Of course, I'm focused on the prayer at the end of it, but the whole psalm is so beautiful. It's so glorious. It's David marveling at how comprehensively God knows him. How deep the the knowledge of God is of David as a human being, his maker, the intimate knowledge that that, uh, God possesses about David. It's, I mean, David just stops right at the beginning as he's beginning to ponder these things, as he's beginning to write about these things. He goes, this is too much for me. This is too wonderful for me to attain. This is too much for me to grasp. Even as I'm forming the words on my lips, you know my words comprehensively. And it's not just God with foreknowledge knowing what David's about to say. David's point is that God knows everything, every motivation, every thought, every hidden motivation of the heart that went into the forming of his words. Every word that comes out of David's mouth, God doesn't just know what he's about to say, God knows why he's about to say it. He knows what David was forming inside of himself, good and bad. All of the negative things that go into what David says, the whole of it, God understands intimately, thoroughly, and completely. It's almost terrifying. And yet David stops for a moment and goes, now with all of that, you're for me. You're hedging me in. You're before me. You're behind me. Your hand is on me. I mean, you're with me. And he just continues to meditate on this point. God, you're with me. I can't go anywhere without you. I can't go anywhere without you pursuing me. Just every, every moment, every line, every phrase of this psalm, it's uh, David just meditating on the beauty of of a God that knows him that intimately, that thoroughly and that completely, and yet is so thoroughly for him and so uh, thoroughly uh, consumed in his pursuit of David in every area of his life. And so as he goes on, he comes to the end, past the part, it's a glorious part to go past, past the part where he says, Even when it comes to your thoughts, God, you know me so intimately, so completely, you know me so wholly, the thoughts that you have towards me are too numerous to count. There's no way that I could fully ever grasp what you think about me. All the thoughts that you have towards me, everything that you say about my life. I mean, I just think about it. We so love the prophetic We love the spirit of prophecy, and part of why we love it is because that deep longing for one of those trillion thoughts, trillions, I mean, it's uncountable. Even a trillion isn't enough. It's uncountable, which means that we're going past a trillion into mathematical numbers that I can't say or grasp. And we love prophecy because we get one. We get one. We get one and we go, ooh, what if God just decided, you know, today I'm going to download a billion. I'm going to give you your down payment of the quintillion. I'm going to give you a billion right now. I mean, that's a, that's a prophecy room right there. <laughs> King David comes right to the end as he's meditated on all of this. <laughs> this is one of my favorite prayers in the whole Bible. As he's meditating on all of this, David does what I just said. David comes to the end thinking about how intimately, completely, thoroughly God knows every part, every aspect, and every motive of David's heart. 
David goes, I can't even count the number of thoughts that you have. He comes to the end and he has that same heart. He goes, tell me, tell me, tell me what you know about me. We pray and we pursue and we wrestle for the knowledge of God. This is one of the prayers in the Bible where we get to wrestle for God's knowledge of us. We actually get to wrestle and pursue God's knowledge of us. He says four things. It's a glorious prayer. I highly recommend praying it. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now again, remember, David said at the very beginning of Psalm 139, you've searched me and you know me. And so to pray that at the end, knowing after having spent 22 verses going on uh, with, with awestruck wonder at how deeply God knows him, he's now coming to the 23rd verse, he's not being redundant or repetitive. This is the cry of David's heart that, the, that the, the one who is known, the one who is understood, the one who is comprehended comprehensively, it's from that heart David goes, now show me. Now what David prays is remarkable. He says, he says, search me out, know me, then try me, test me, shake me. This is one of the most remarkable prayers in the Bible. It's not one that we pray often. It's one, though, that I think the Holy Spirit is going to put on our hearts to pray more and more as the days go on, as we get closer. You know, today, this, what happened last night in Japan, that's, that's just a whisper. That, isn't, that doesn't even make the cut of Matthew 24 and uh, the, things, the things that are going to shake the earth and trouble the earth that we're not to be troubled by. Last night doesn't make the cut. There's uh, all kinds of prophetic words and all kinds of prophetic concerns and all kinds of things that people are shaken by right now. What's going to happen next year? What's going to happen in 2012? What's going to happen in 2015? And there's so many that are shaken by immediate prophetic words of trouble and the prophetic words of immediate trouble don't even make the cut of Matthew 24. They don't even make the cut. Jesus lists this list of global shakings that aren't even judgments. He lists in Matthew 24 these global shakings, and right at the beginning of it, he says, now see that you are not troubled. See that you are not troubled. Here's a great uh, faith test for you. Here's a great gauge in terms of where you are, in terms of oil on your heart, confidence in Jesus, confidence in love, confidence in, his, in faith in him. Here's a great test. When you hear prophetic words of immediate shaking in the next couple years, are you troubled? If you are troubled, know this. You haven't even come to the things that Jesus said not to be troubled by. And so you're getting troubled by stuff that doesn't even make the cut, and there's more intense, not troubling stuff coming. Then the troubling stuff comes. And so the prayer of David is a glorious invitation to the Lord now, before the more intense, not troubling stuff comes, before the troubling stuff comes, before the judgment comes, the prayer of David is a glorious invitation to the Lord, God, before you trouble everybody else, trouble me. God, before you trouble the nations, before you shake the nations, shake me. God, I wanna get there stable, I wanna get there steady, I wanna get there confident. And what do I mean by there? I mean when the Lord really begins to shake and trouble the nations and begin to remove the things they find comfort in. To begin to remove the things that they find rest in, that they find joy in, illegitimate things that are not God. The nations draw comfort and confidence from so much that is not God. And it's not just that God wants to shake because he's mad about that point and he's jealous at the illegitimate things. It's that God knows that the illegitimate things form a flimsy foundation that's easily disrupted when trouble comes. The manner in which men are able to maintain their dignity on a flimsy foundation that's easily shaken, and the moment that a little bit of trouble comes, they begin to lose their dignity, lose their way, and they begin to rage on the inside and on the outside. Real rage is coming, real offense, real bitterness, real betrayal, real trouble, real sin, real wickedness at another level is coming. 
And the question for us is to what measure will we stand in confidence with Jesus in that day and to what measure will we stand with the mockers and the scoffers on that day? Now, if left to ourselves, we tend towards one of two options. In our, if left to ourselves, if we're the ones that have to answer that question, apart from God's opinion, if we're the ones that are gonna answer that question, then we, we usually go one of two ways. We either in our minds exaggerate how great we're doing or we exaggerate how not great we're doing. That's generally how we tend to approach intense messages that are forcing us to confront how we're doing. If we have to answer that question ourselves, we either, we either think I'm doing great or we think I'm not doing great, I'm an utter wretched failure. failure. And, uh, and what God wants to do is to produce the, the rhythms in us that begin to continually lean into him to get his opinion on the matter. Then the prayer of David, not just to get his opinion on the matter, then to get God's help on the matter. The sufficiency of Christ to bring us into the fullness of his destiny is potent, but we never touch that sufficiency if we never ask. And so what's glorious about the prayer of David and the parable of the four soils, the prayer forms the plea and the four soils forms the mirror and both work together for us to begin to lean in, be honest before God about who we are and what's happening in us and then begin to lean in for grace-driven solutions with power. And that's what we wanna do. We don't want to throw up our hands in despair at what's coming, but neither do we want to throw up our hands in false bravado or false confidence in what's coming. The false grace message isn't just a message of sin and God will forgive. There's a measure of the false grace message that's knit to false bravado, a disconnect from how you're actually doing that leaves you unprepared for what's coming. I'll give, you a, I'll give you a quick self-analysis. How are you going to do? Now again, bravado in the light of shaking usually says something like, well, I'm not afraid of anything and I love God and I don't care about money and I don't care about this, that, and the other thing and I'm gonna be great. I'm gonna make it. Great. But, what the, but what's going to happen is the shaking that's coming isn't just gonna touch you, it's gonna touch your kids. It's gonna touch your wives, your husbands, it's not so much about how you're going to do in the midst of trouble, it's how you're going to respond when trouble touches people you care passionately about. Why do people betray? Why do people hate? Why do people rage? They hate, they betray, they rage. Now lots of it, well, you know, must, a lot of it'll happen, what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, because, it'll happen because of our own desire for self-preservation disconnected from confidence in God. Wrong opinions about God, wrong ideas about God, wrong paradigms about God lead to withdrawal and self-protection. But more common isn't going to be the way that we rage in self-protection, it's going to be the way that we rage in kid protection, the way that we rage in spouse protection. I've met so many wives that can endure a lot until somebody begins poking their husband. And the husband comes out of it fine. The husband gets slandered, the husband gets slapped, the husband gets rebuked, the husband gets wrongly accused. And, the, and you know, you ask the husband, how you doing with all this? And he goes, yeah, I'm fine, trust the Lord. You look at the wife and the wife's like, You just do not want to leave the wife alone in a room with the accuser. <laughs> I mean, imagine what happens. I mean, imagine that dynamic with something even more precious. Because, you know, so we go, okay, our husbands are tough, our wives are tough. But then you start touching our kids. Then you start touching our kids. Oh, I just think about some of the stories of the martyrs. I mean, they're quite, like, shocking. Some of the stories of the martyrs. And it's not... The martyrs themselves that's shocking, it's the ones that died for their faith having to watch their children die first. And here's how I know that I'm not ready. Here's how I know that I'm disconnected. I know that I'm disconnected because I would be prouder of my son getting elected president of the United States than I would watching him be martyred for his faith. When in heaven's perspective, getting martyred, the martyr's crown, the victorious crown of martyrdom from heaven's perspective is one of the most glorious honors that can be bestowed on a Christian. But mostly, as a weak, broken human being, I would look at that and think, when I get my hands on you, martyrer, I'm going to kill you. 
I'm not thinking, you did it, son. You did it. Or in the time of testing, I'm not thinking, you're going to do it, son. You're going to do it, daughters. You're going to make it. I'm mostly that desire to protect them and preserve them is mostly the predominant thing in my heart. Well, here's the thing. Now, now, here's the other trick. Here's the other trick for shaking to come. I'll give you another little practical tr tip for uh, shaking. There are going to be some times where you're actually required as a parent to protect your children, to protect your spouse, where it's actually biblical, right, and good to do so. And there are other times where it's required of you to step back and trust God. How are you going to know which one in which context to do? How are you going to know? In other words, in that moment, you're not gonna be able to call up your most trusted spiritual advisor. In that moment, you're not gonna be able to find the right Bible verse. Only what's in you will preserve you in that moment. Only what you take with you into that moment of shaking is what you have to draw from by grace in the moment to choose rightly. And again, practically what that means is you have to be able to dial down in the midst of great pressure, great confusion, great rage. Because again, you're thinking, when we think, I, I think I'll make it through trouble, we're thinking in terms of human reasoning and human, what humans can grasp in terms of shaking, we're not necessarily thinking about the kind of trouble that causes men to pass out from fear. And it's in that context, and it's okay to be troubled at that point, it's in that context that we're actually supposed to be able to draw from real oil on the inside. We're actually supposed to be able to draw from a real root system and a history in God. It's at that moment that we're supposed to be able to rest, enjoy God, dial down and hear from him. It's at, it's at that moment. That is a little slice of what, the, of what the trials to come look like. Can we dial down in the most difficult context to dial down and actually hear and engage with joyfully the Holy Spirit? Can we agree with him in those moments? Can we agree with him? And I'm not just talking about theologically. I'm talking about can we actually lean with faith and confidence and be able to hear with precision in terms of real critical decisions, not just for us, but for those around us. And so, in the kindness of the Lord, whether we ask him to or not, now if we ask him to, it's more helpful because we start looking for this kind of thing, but even if we don't ask him, even if we don't ask him, the Lord will come in his kindness and his mercy and he'll begin to shake our lives. He does it in kindness. The reason that he shakes our lives is knit to the prayer of David. We are disconnected from what is true about us. That's what makes this prayer, letter A, that's what makes this prayer so profound. David is, conne is connected to the truth that he is not connected. David is connected to the fact that he's disconnected. That is one of the most profound things that you can know about yourself and be honest about yourself in regards to your disconnect. Again, we all imagine that if God gives us the information in advance, that we're going to act on that information well, we're gonna make right choices, and we're gonna be godly in the moment. We are just like Peter. Jesus says, Peter, I'm gonna prophesy over you right now. I'm gonna prophesy over you. Shaking and trouble and trial is coming to you. Now, in this specific case, Jesus says, hey, I was talking to Satan the other day, which is always an you know, intense way to start a conversation. <laughs> hey, I was talking to Satan the other day, and he was asking about you. Oh, Satan was asking for me. Yeah, by name. Oh, interesting. Oh, well, how'd that go? <laughs> well, well, he, uh, he asked me permission to sift you like wheat. He asked me if it was okay to grind you like powder. What'd you say? <laughs> oh, I said, go for it. <laughs> and I'm praying for you. But how's it gonna turn out? Yeah, I'm praying for you. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Well, 
Poor Peter. I mean, I love Peter. Because Jesus goes, I'm going to prophesy about you, Peter. I'm going to prophesy about you. I'm going to give you a prophecy. Remember that word, prophecy. I'm going to give you a prophecy. This, in this prophecy, a rooster is going to crow three times. That will be the number of times you deny me. In your great time of testing, you will deny me. Now, Peter, hearing the prophecy, says, I will never deny you. In other words, Peter does what we do. We think that the prophecy is to inform and prepare us so that we do not do. And so Peter, getting information in advance, gets resolved within himself to not do. Peter goes, I'm not telling you, Jesus goes, I'm not telling you what you're not going to do. I'm prophesying what you're going to do. This is a prophecy, not a warning. This is a prophecy, not inside information on your future. This is a prophecy. I'm not going to do it, Lord. Okay, well, I prophesied and I'm God. (laughs) Think about arguing with a prophecy from God. Well, guess what? (laughs) We do it all the time. We argue against God every time we judge our neighbor because we're telling God that we're wholly different than that one. Every time we see someone do something that we disapprove of and we go, I would never do that. Every time we're actually speaking accusations against our very nature, claiming to be different for no other reason than we like ourselves way too much. When really the only rational response when men stumble and women fail and humans are human, the only rational response is, wow, that's me. Wow, that's me too. I'm that guy. I'm that girl. It's one of my favorite uh, answers to, uh, to this quandary is the one that a man named David Pawson gave as someone was talking about those homosexuals. They were talking about those homosexuals, and of course, David Pawson looks at them and goes, well, I'm a homosexual. And the person goes, what? I mean, he thinks that David Pawson just dropped a secret bomb on him that he's confessing. And, and uh, David Pawson goes, no, no, I'm not confessing. I'm telling you what's true about me from Romans 1. The capacities of man in sin. All of those are in me too. And God is delivering me from them just like he's delivering you. All of those capacities are in us. Now I know that we forget that when we're on the prayer mic praying for the homosexuals from California who are the cause of all our nation's problems. My goodness, I would hate to be homosexual and from California and from Hollywood and watch our prayer meetings. I would hate that. Because if I was homosexual from Hollywood, California, I would think that you guys have all targeted me specifically and hate me with a passion. That's why we pray apostolic prayers. We pray apostolic prayers, which are not just, it's not just positive thinking, it's actually a recognition that we're in this together. We all have a sinful and broken nature and we're contending for the breakthrough of God for all of us together. Because we're, rec- we're honest, we're, we're coming into the truth about the fact that we're broken. Now what's glorious about an awakening and a move of the Holy Spirit is that it actually can be enjoyable to come into this truth to a measure. You don't have to kick rocks and be ashamed of it. You don't have to walk around with some kind of like penance kind of attitude. That you can actually be confident in God's love, that he actually set his love on us, he set his affections on us, he says he desires us, he establishes value, he establishes our worth, he says you are worth every drop of blood I spilt, and if I had more blood to give, I would have spilled more for you. That's how, much, that's how valuable you are to me. And you are a wretch and a sinner. Like we sometimes get so lost in Jesus saying that we're valuable, we forget that we're a wretch and a sinner. And sometimes we get so lost in wretch and sinner, we forget that we're valuable. And Jesus goes, you're both. You're both. But not for much longer. But you're both. And so David had the unique privilege 
of being one that was fully confident in God's love, Psalm 139. He's fully confident in God's desire for him. He's fully confident in God's passionate pursuit of him. He's so confident in God's abandoned love for him and intimate knowledge of him, and yet he is so confident in the fact that he's a wretched, sinful, disconnected dullard. It's both. He goes, God, I'm dull. Show me how dull I am. Shake me. Stir me, awaken me, point out to me how dull I am. Letter B, we're often too dull of heart and disconnected from God to truly and fully appreciate how dull of heart and disconnected we are from God. I like how Isaiah says it in Isaiah 6. Isaiah goes, here's the thing, I'm a man of unclean lips. So much of my wickedness comes from my speech. My speech defiles me on a daily basis. But Isaiah says, you know, the problem is actually deeper than that. Because it's not just that I'm a man of unclean lips, but I actually come from an entire culture of unclean lips. Everybody talks too much, everyone's chatty, everyone says nothing, and everyone defiles themselves in the saying of it, and the culture so prevails around me that nine times out of 10, I don't even know that I'm sinning. That's why he said, woe is me, I am undone. Because he's realizing how deep the problems go. I don't even know I'm sinning half the time. Not only do I sin in ways that I know, but my culture actually hides my, blinds my eyes to the 10 things I don't know. And so David's prayer is so profound. He goes, God, I'm inviting your shaking into my life. I'm inviting your dealings into my life. I want to invite trouble to reveal things about me that I wouldn't see in optimum contexts. David is praying for less than optimum context. I can't think of anything more gruesomely opposed to American Christianity than that concept. We are constantly praying for the optimum context. And David is actually inviting the less than optimum because he has a greater prize in mind. Oh, I want to be fully yours in every area of my life. I want to be fully given in every thought that I think. I'm not going to be satisfied until every word, every choice, and every thought is fully yours. God, do what you have to do to show me what's hindering me, and then when you show me, lead me, help me, release power on my life to get free. I'm not stopping until we're one. What a beautiful heart. He opens up the whole of his heart up to God's examination and then opens up the whole of his life to God's power to be free. He gives a wholehearted yes to God's dealings to reveal and God's dealings to remove. He does both. Well, the parable of the four soils is helpful because we can begin the journey and we have to do it with honesty, a spirit of truth. Parable of the four soils operates as a mirror reflecting back to us where we truly are and what we need to say yes to in order to lay hold of the fullness of God. In order to lay hold of all that God wants to give us and all that we have laying laying ahead of us, looking forward to in God. The prayer of David is critical when approaching the parable in order to receive all that God wants to impart and all that God wants to do to train our thinking and to train our doing to lay hold of his fullness. Just one, a couple of points before I dive into the parable of the four soils. It's a couple of points about the parables. Now, the parable, obviously it's retold three times in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's told three times. And this is what I love about the Holy Spirit. The parable is retold three times, but it's not told exactly the same way three times. The Holy Spirit inspires Matthew, inspires Mark, and inspires Luke to put little treasures and differences and additions to the account. They'll say it slightly differently. They'll put a different angle on it. Here's what's amazing about the parable of the four soils. You can't get a complete picture of what Jesus is talking about by reading one of the three parables in its retellings. You actually get a full picture of what Jesus is talking about when you read all three accounts. You have to read all three, and you have to have an eye for detail. To have an eye for detail, you have to care. To care, you have to love the Word. To love the Word, you have to love God. To love God, you have to have grace on your life. To have grace on your life, you have to be saved. It's quite glorious (laughs) how it works. The Lord is just drawing us in and giving us and feeding us this love for the word that forces us to be detailed and careful in our examination of it. 
Because he, he frames, now the one thing that is the same in all three retellings, the one phrase that is the same, you see it in Matthew 13, 9. Jesus says it exactly the same way three times. He says the big phrase. He says, he that has ears, let him hear. That is a massive, that is an incredibly important phrase. Because when Jesus says that, again, our default mechanism is to engage in our natural faculties, engage in our force of will, and lean in with our own strength and go, I will now hear, Lord. Well, that's actually not the point of the phrase. The point of the phrase is, you're not going to hear what I'm going to say next. How do we know that that's what that phrase means? Jesus says so in the very next verse. In the very next passage, Jesus says, he says, he that has an ear, let him hear, pulls the disciples aside and goes, none of them are gonna hear me. What are you talking about? Well, that's what, what I just said. That's what it means. It means that most of the people that heard what I just said aren't gonna have a clue what I just said. The next time an unbeliever wants to tell you that Jesus was a great teacher, throw Matthew 13 at him. Matthew 13 destroys the Jesus was a great teacher, not God argument. It destroys it because Matthew 13, Jesus is a purposefully bad teacher. Wow, it's brilliant how Jesus used agricultural analogies to connect to agricultural people. No, Jesus used a confusing parable on purpose to confuse them. He actually did not want them to understand unless they wanted to understand. So he was not going to say it to them plainly. He was not going to say it to them plainly. He says it wrapped in mystery. He says it wrapped in parable so that the only people that want to grasp what he's saying are the people that want to grasp what he's saying. He that has an ear, let him hear, means you're not going to get this on the run. You're not just gonna get this in the hearing. You only get this if you want to get this. And again, again, of course, we go to the default. We go, Peter, I want to get this. I want to hear this. I will lean in, I will listen, I will hear this. Again, we constantly give the wrong answer, which is okay, God's so humble, he's so kind, he helps us. The right answer is this. He who has an ear, let him hear. I am not great at listening. I only remember 10% of what I hear and that's only if I'm trying with all my might. Mostly I'm distracted wondering who's texting me on my cell phone and trying to think about my grocery list. I'm not good at this at all. I miss most of what's preached to me and I don't understand the Bible. (laughs) That's what he who has an ear, let him hear actually means. It means, oh no, if you don't help me right now, I'm gonna miss this and I can't miss it. My future depends on getting this. My future, and that's what Jesus is saying. This parable is about our future. Our future depends on us getting what Jesus is saying. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Connected to the fear of the Lord is the truth of the human. The truth of the human is the beginning of wisdom. That's why you fear God. You fear God in part because the truth about you is really ugly. God. My future depends on these words that you're saying. If that's true, we're, in, we're all in trouble. <laughs> we're all in trouble because I am dull of heart. I am unrenewed in my thinking. I am so disconnected. And even worse, I think I'm connected. I think I'm getting it. But I realize 10 years later when you show me stuff how dull I was. How many can, can relate to that? You look back 10 years, for, 10 years ago and you think, was I even saved? How did I even get to this point? The older you get, I'm convinced, the more that you don't quit and the more you win as the chorus goes, the more you don't quit, the more you keep winning, the more you keep going, wow, I really believe in the sovereignty of God and his sufficiency, his grace that sustains me. I really believe less and less in me and my ability to do this thing. Because I look back 10 years ago at how dull I was. I mean, I'm not just talking about altar calls I answered that I thought that I was getting. I'm talking about sermons I preached with passages I was sure I understood. I look back and I go, oh, I can't even believe I preached the sermon. I didn't get that passage at all. That's the fear and trembling component of preaching. Anytime the preacher preaches, he has to recognize that 10 years from now, he's going to go, oh, was I even walking that? Was I, did I even believe that? I mean, God is so kind. He that has an ear, let us hear. There's layers to this parable. We have to give careful I'm on page two at the top. Careful, detailed devotion in in the receiving of this parable 
in order to get the hold of Jesus' heart here. We need his grace and help. His goal is our fullness without coming short. That's his goal. When he looks at your life, when he thinks about your life, at least a billion of his quintillion thoughts towards you have to do with your fullness, with his help, not coming short. It's the fourth soil, which I'm not really gonna touch on tonight. It's the fourth soil, but it's that key phrase. It's defining one of the ways that we lay hold of what's on God's heart. Uh, Jesus calls it bearing fruit with patience. How do you know that you're doing well? How do you know that you're, that you're progressing in the faith? How do you know that you're, that you're beginning to connect to what it means to have a heart that's good soil, to have a heart that's beginning to bear fruit, to have a heart that's beginning to move towards a, a 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold return? How do you know? When, when Jesus says 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold return at the end of the parable, he's talking about choices that matter, choices that exchange with payback. He's talking about decisions that will matter to you a billion years from now. He's not talking about what Paul talked about, the life of wood, stubble, and hay that burns up the moment you cross the threshold and you're in the age to come and you have a new body, but you have, you're saved as if through fire. You have no return for your choices. You're saved, you made it, but not one of your choices made any difference or any impact to anyone around you. Think about that. Think about the knowledge that every expenditure of your time was vanity, vanity and meaningless. Jesus goes, I wanna connect you to fruit that matters. I wanna connect you to real fruitfulness, bearing fruit with patience, beginning to lay hold of a life that has returned to it, that actually, I'm actually gonna give you something for the choices you make, for the life you live, for the thoughts you think, for the way that you love. And, and so much of his return has nothing to do with what we esteem as valuable ministry. You don't, the 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, so much of what he's gonna give us back has to do with the way that we loved our wives. It has to do with the way that we loved our husbands. So much of what Jesus is going to give back to us has nothing to do with preaching at all. It has to do with living. If you're, a, if you're a full-time preacher, if full-time preacher is your occupation, you're only on a platform about 10% of your time if you're super busy. Still 90% of the time, you gotta take trash out, and you gotta wipe butts, and you gotta give compliments, and you gotta do dishes, and you gotta vacuum floors. And it's there that you find the glorious return of love, the great exchange that Jesus counts worthy of rewarding. We're bearing fruit with patience. We're loving well. But what I want to look at is the, the first three soils. I'm going to say one, one other thing, just one other tip. I've found that it's helpful to read the parable, read its purpose, Jesus' little warning, which is really intense. He that has an ear, let him hear. Okay, the purpose of the parables are that they don't hear. Wow, okay, that's... We want to... Now, now... Again, because we're who we are and because we're how we are, we probably read the purpose of the parable and go, <laughs> dull Jews, missing it again. How many times are they gonna miss what Jesus said? I mean, just, just know that. If you don't repent for that sentence, Jesus is going to wheel out the VCR. <laughs> and it's gonna be you going, Ah, dumb Jews, how many times did they miss what Jesus said? And then you're gonna see the playback of the 10 times you missed what Jesus said. And that's Jesus being kind. <laughs> I've found that it's helpful to read the parable, its purpose, and its explanation all the way through. Then, the way that I study it is I'll read the interpretation, then I will go back and read the parable again with the interpretation now. And I'll put the two together in the reading of it. Now, what I find to be, and I know I'm gonna be belaboring a point in saying this, but I want to belabor this point because I want us to be honest about us. But what I find is that the, the way more typical manner in which people read the parable of the four soils is they skip the parable altogether because they know that the answers are in the back of the book. 
So they skip the parable altogether, go right to interpretation, and in interpretation, go right to the fourth soil because that's where they assume they are. Now, if you're not that, you probably go right to the third and fourth soil because you're definitely not one of those first soilers. Absolutely not a second soiler. You're at least a third soiler, but probably a fourth. <laughs> we have to recognize that this parable judges us as we read it. We have to recognize that this parable exposes what's true about us as we read it, even if we don't know it's happening. Case in point will be the first soil, but we'll get there in a moment. We cannot be too quick to assign a category for ourselves and assume that we land in a category. Remember, he who has an ear, let him hear. Don't, how do you know that you're to think categories when you think this? How do you know that you're supposed to find which of the four that you are? How do you know that you're only one of the four? Again, we decide quickly what the parable is about and slot ourselves into what we decided without stopping to ask the Holy Spirit about it. And so we've already interpreted the passage before we study it, that's called eisegesis. It's important to understand that in this parable, another thing, another, another uh, interpretation point. All four soils, all four represent believers. All four represent believers, and the various, way, the various ways that we receive the word, the various ways that we receive the word. I just wanna say that again. The parable represents the various ways, plural, that we receive the word. In other words, you're probably a combination of the four. I'm just gonna tell you in advance. As it's scattered by the sower. In hearing this parable, we can be quick to think of others who fit these descriptions rather than evaluating our own heart condition which is the purpose of the parable. Let's look at the first soil. The seed falls by the wayside. I put, I put all the different versions of it that are different in each little passage. Jesus said, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them. Okay, what does that mean? He says, Jesus says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. And, the ones, and th these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. That's another way to say it. Luke says, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and it was trampled down and the birds of the air devoured it. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. What is Jesus saying? Again, you have to take all three accounts to put together the whole version of what Jesus is saying. Otherwise, you might think that if you have a hard time understanding the word, you're a candidate for the devil to come immediately and snatch it and leave you helpless. That's not necessarily the point when you put the whole thing together. The first group are believers who receive the word. And again, we know they're believers because Jesus says it's sown into their hearts and they hear. It's sown in their hearts. But it has no impact on their hearts. Why do believers who hear the word, why does it have no impact in the hearing of the word? In fact, tonight... There's a percentage of you who are hearing what I'm saying and you like the, the light part of it, but, you, but what I'm saying isn't really impacting you. Why is that? Well, for a couple of reasons. Matthew and Luke combined tell us why. They do not understand it, therefore they trample it underfoot, meaning they don't understand means don't value, don't treasure, and don't nurture what's given to you. Just think about for a moment the picture of what Jesus is describing. A sower is scatter, scattering seed and some of the seed lands on the wayside, it lands on the side of the road where it will do no good, where it will die, where it will be useless. And the person watches the seed get scattered around them and Luke tells us they just kinda step on it. Huh, there's seed here. 
What's that a picture of? It's a picture of someone that doesn't understand the incalculable value of the seed that's by his feet. Now, if somebody had said, time out, that seed that you're trampling, and I'm not, I don't think that the trampling is a purposeful stepping on because they're mad at the word. That's not what's going on. What's going on is, when you put it together, it's simply a picture of somebody that doesn't get what's going on. They don't get the value of the words of Christ. If somebody stopped and said, look, each one of those seeds is worth a billion dollars, what would that person do? They would stop, they would try not to step on the seed, they would dance around, they would they would bend over, they would scrape up as much seed as they could get into their hands and either pocket it or put it in good soil somewhere. Why? Because they have a revelation of the worth of the seeds. What the sower is sowing is the word of God. Every word is a treasure. Every word has immense, indescribable value. Jesus himself says that in Matthew 13. He says it. Let's look at it. He says in verse 16, he's he's saying they don't understand this. They're not gonna get this. And really what he's saying is they're not gonna get this because they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear. They don't wanna get it. They're not really listening. They're wowed by the signs and they're here to see wonders, but they don't really want to hear the word. They don't want to hear the word. Now, Now, the folks in this room and many in the body of Christ are people that want to hear the word. But there has to be more than a wanting to. There has to be a revelation of its value. And that's Jesus' point in in verse 16. He says, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Why are you blessed? Because he says, for assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it. And they longed to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Jesus says, you don't understand how glorious this Bible study is right now that you're having. This Bible study that we're having over four soils, as I'm teaching you about the kingdom of God, as I'm teaching you the word of God, this Bible study we're having, Isaiah longed to see this day. Isaiah longed to hear the words I'm saying right now. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, David, Moses, Abraham, they longed to be in this group. They yearned to be part of this Bible study and they're not here. You are. They didn't see it, they didn't hear it. You're seeing it and you're hearing it. Before Jesus even goes into the parable and Matthew's telling of it, he stops and goes, guys, we get to do this. You get to be here with me doing a Bible study with the Son of God. The one who wrote these words with my finger of fire on the tablet is now here with you in the flesh explaining the words. And the 12 are going, wait a minute. Are you saying that King David wished he could be me? Because they're thinking, I'm a wretch, I'm a sinner, I'm not worthy of this, depart from me, Lord, I'm just, I'm just a sinner. And Jesus goes, yeah, but guess what? King David wishes he could be you. King David wishes he could be here. Isaiah wishes he could be here. And so every time we skim over these verses, and we're skimming over Jesus himself going, guys, You don't understand what these pages are. You don't understand what these pages mean. You don't understand the value of them and what the prophets of old long to see, you get to look at every time you go to bed at night. What Isaiah longed to partake of, you get to open any time you want and talk to the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Isaiah prophesied that there was a mystery of righteousness related to the indwelling spirit, but you get to experience it. You get to do what the 12 did, except you get to do it by yourself. There's not 11 other guys asking questions. It's just you and Jesus through the Holy Spirit with precious words that prophets long to see. This is critical. When standing, when one stands on the wayside with valuable seed, where it cannot have any impact or growth, recognizing that value simply means picking it up and placing it where it's gonna grow. 
This is the imagery that the gospel writers are emphasizing in this section. The hearers have no revelation of the value of what they're receiving and thus trample it underfoot, not spitefully, but inattentively. They trampled it because they did not understand what it was and they didn't understand why it was valuable. The enemy is not gonna steal the word from the heart of some, from someone who doesn't simply grasp it. In other words, if you're here in the room and you're leaning and you're asking God for help and you're talking to him and you're, you're digging into the word and there's that fog, you just can't break through and you just can't get certain passages, the enemy is not gonna come in and steal the word from you. Who Jesus is talking about is the one that's casual about the word. They sit in sermon after sermon, but the words have no impact. They read the Bible as a part of their to-do list of Christianity, but they're not talking to God about the words. They're not, there's not a leaning in their heart. There's not an interior dialogue. There's not a running conversation over the word. There's not a chewing. There's not a thinking. In other words, so many walk in this 